Welcome to Longevity Advantage. This is your host, Scott Fulton. Good to be with you again today. This program we did as a live group on a Zoom chat, uh, but I wanted to come back and redo it uh, a little bit better quality than we were able to do on Zoom. The program is entitled The Food Supply Revolution. Why are we talking about food supply in longevity? Well, it's important to understand that Food is more than just the things we eat. Where it comes from has a big impact on what our longevity potential is. And it's an area where most of us have a lot to learn, and partly because things have changed uh, quite a bit in in just recent years and are going to change a lot more in the the next couple of years going forward. So when we think about our food, what's going to change now is regenerative agriculture is really going to become the new standard in organic uh, and let's take a look today at what that means. Uh, the cover here is uh, Zach Bush, uh, MD. Zach is leading the nonprofit uh, known as Farmers Footprint, which is a group organized to help educate farmers uh, and get them up to speed on how to how to apply and get the best out of regenerative agriculture. And we've also got a piece uh, from Kiss the Ground, which is a another nonprofit who's done a great job tying back to how regenerative agriculture helps on the environmental side. So over on the left there, it's really this this five elements between the farmer. Obviously, we want the farmer to be doing better than they are today, and that, that's certainly a, a piece you'll get a better understanding. Uh, the connection to the soil, because that's really what's going to change a lot uh, as we go forward. We'll talk more about that. Obviously, the food is the product that the farmer's trying to put out and the food that's going to be tied to our longevity, uh, what impact the process has on the environment, and us as a consumer uh, tying back to the farmer again and the food and the environment. So so we all have an important role to play in here, and I think you'll understand some some of the changes coming forward when we start to uh, apply more regenerative agriculture going forward. This slide just gets us grounded in how is our land actually used for farming and other uses, and we can see that only 4.4% is actually used for human food in terms of what we would typically think of as a farm. Meanwhile, 41% is dedicated to livestock pasture and feed. So a large percentage of that is going to be feed for cattle. Meanwhile, we're importing 30% of our fresh fruit and vegetables, which seems a little out of balance given what our growing capacity is. The plow was really the point at when we got organized as civilizations and started to build communities, because that's what allowed us to now start to support communities in a farming operation. And so everything was centered around farming. And you see that small plow on the right there. The earliest plow was really just scratching the ground enough to be able to get some seed in and break the land up a little bit. Right around the turn of the century, as in the last turn of the century, that's really where the plow started to change from a scratching tool into a turning tool, where it started to dig deeper and actually turn the soil over, which created a lot more disturbance in the soil. And later in the the last century is when we introduced the tractor which gave us a lot more horsepower than just the oxen pulling. And so we could introduce compound plows, which allowed us to get the work done faster. So following up on the mechanical equipment is really where the chemical companies got involved. And the chemical companies are involved deeply both in the seeds that are generated for agriculture and the agricultural chemicals that go along, whether they be inputs in terms of plant food or fertilizers, we think may think of them, but also in the herbicides and pesticides as well. And so as you look at this is a fairly recent chart now because Corteva is one of the newer companies coming out of the the chemical company uh, Reorg uh, a couple of years ago. So you can see they certainly control a big part of the market and a lot of it is because they produce GMO seeds which are related to uh, what we would generally refer to as Roundup Ready or some other pesticide ready seed uh, designed to help kill the the weeds but, uh, but not kill the plant. So their, uh, their answer to feeding the world was a chemical-based solution. And of course, as we now start to bring more of the mechanical solutions together with more of the chemicals, here's a monstrously impressive 600 horsepower case international harvester Nutratiller. So that, uh, that, that plows 24 rows at a time, injects chemicals on the fly while it's going. So obviously that's, uh, that's at a high commercial rate. Um, so, so tremendous land disturbance in the course of doing that, and we'll start to understand more about that uh, in a minute here too. 
So on the mechanical side, that also plays a part in weeding. Again, this is different types of plows. Uh, so the one is uh, on the, the left there, you can see, is more traditional in terms of plowing in between the rows to try to break up the soil. And then on the right, you can see in an orchard using a disc to, uh, to help break up the soil. So the idea there is all built around trying to break up the soil, which uh, is designed to help keep the weeds down and, uh, and hopefully capture some moisture before it uh, dries to a hard pancake again. So with all those chemicals going into the ground, we have a bit of a watershed issue in North America and particularly in the US, all centered around the Mississippi River. So we have all these river systems that all feed down to the Mississippi Basin and dump out it in, into the Gulf of Mexico. And you see all that area is all big farming area, what we typically think of as prime farmland in the country. So the problem of course is that all gets more and more concentrated as Typically, it's, uh, it's water-soluble chemicals that are flowing down into the Mississippi and, uh, and concentrating more and more as it moves towards the Mississippi and down into the Mississippi Delta. So you can take a look at here at how much of that area is covered by farms. Again, a lot of that is going to be pasture-related farming, obviously. And then you can also see the impact down in the Gulf of Mexico. So National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration 2017 estimated that was about 8,800 square miles of essentially dead, dead zone in the uh, Gulf in that area. On the bottom left, you can see the impact of all of the outflows of both uh, chemicals uh, that are coming down in the form of pesticides, but also the soil that uh, gets carried down the Mississippi and deposits out there as well. So the, the biggest chemical used obviously is Roundup. If you haven't heard about that, you must have been sleeping for the last few years. Um, and you can see the increase from 1996, about 15x of what it was in 1996, just to 2012, and it has continued to increase since then. And so we're seeing more and more uses, it's, uh, particularly as we get GMO crops now that are designed to handle far more uh, Roundup on them. Uh, to date, there's been over 2 million tons deposited in that area, and that means that 2 million tons, a large percent of it has... Uh, found its way to runoff and ends up down into the uh, saturating all that earth zone you see leading in and around the Mississippi River. So how much is 2 million tons of Roundup? Well, it's equivalent to about 50 of those storage complexes you see there. It's about 500 million gallons, uh, 1,600 of those tanks. So obviously that's a lot of pesticide over the years that has been accumulated and, uh, and deposited. So you've probably noticed how organic foods have become more and more popular, particularly in the last three years. We've seen a tremendous spike in organic sales, uh, which is, I think, a, a good sign for lots of reasons. Um, it certainly puts a lower toxic load onto the plant and the humans and the environment by reducing a lot of the uh, herbicides and pesticides. Uh, there's been a tremendous consumer demand for it uh, that continues to spike. It's the fastest growing market in the food industry. Some of the problems with it, with it, though, is that the soil is still starved for inputs. Um, it's still relying on fertilizers for inputs. Uh, it's quite labor and equipment intense to be able to, to farm some crops this way. And it has some challenging economics for the farmer, which really goes a lot to accounting for the uh, incremental cost increase we see at the grocery store or at the market. But it's been a great transitional advancement, and, uh, and it really sets us up for what's going to be the next phase in organic. I have a short video for you here from Kiss the Ground. Kiss the Ground, as I mentioned earlier, is a nonprofit organization. They do a great job of explaining the environmental aspects of regenerative agriculture and uh, some good, good grounding knowledge for everybody on this. If you're like most people, you're probably feeling a little hopeless about climate change and the damage we've done to our planet. Well, now there's a new way to look at climate change and how to deal with it that might just turn that hopelessness into hope. Climate change, as we know, is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere. But carbon is not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it, even us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants first appeared on land, 
carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance between these pools, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, that would be us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool, which was pretty much a timeout zone for carbon. We've been burning it for energy, putting into play, and disrupting that balance. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. The oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, throwing off the ocean's balance, resulting in ocean acidification and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. So in order to save life as we know it, of course we need to stop burning fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon to get the cycle back in balance? The good news is that the answer is literally right under our feet. It's the soil. Plants, using sunlight and water, naturally perform photosynthesis. They pull carbon in from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of these sugars down through the roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build healthy soil. Voila, carbon moved. The plants pump it in and the soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost can help regenerate healthy soil, setting up an ongoing feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. Together with other regenerative practices, like not tilling the soil, planting trees and cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain billions of tons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. Unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil, which is nutrient rich and full of life and holds way more water. This means more nutritious food and crops that are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for farmers, families, and everyone who eats. Remember this, the way we grow our food, fiber, and fuel either puts carbon up into our atmosphere or pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of our soils, and the health of our planet are one and the same. Hope you enjoyed that. It's a, it's a great, a great example. So as we think about regenerative agriculture, we're really talking about shifting the paradigm. So we're going to shift from competing with nature to more a partnership with nature. And we all know who wins when you're fighting nature, right? And I think farming is finally, finally getting to that point. Um, we're going to move from disturbing the soil to protecting the soil. Uh, we're going to move from a monoculture or monocrops into more diverse uh, farming. And we're going to change from being a reductionist uh, mindset into a holistic mindset. So all those things put together create a very new and different approach to farming that is really a combination of some of the older practices that we've known for thousands of years, married with some of the newer science now that we understand around soil chemistry and plant uh, biology. So the next film I want to share with you is uh, from Farmer's Footprint. Again, it's the other nonprofit that I mentioned at the top. Uh, they're really leading the way in regenerative agriculture, uh, organizing a tremendous uh, effort now with farmers and to resource the farmers who are all looking for help now to, to educate on how to get away from chemical-based farming into, uh, into more profitable farming for them. And, uh, and really this film gets you a close look at what life is on the farm. So if you've never spent any time on the farm uh, or it's been a long time, I think you'll find this quite enlightening.
Grant and Dawn and their daughter Carly have all become outspoken advocates. Actually, we sort of consider them one of our shining stars of the regenerative agriculture movement. I don't know if, if anyone remembers the old Barbara Mandrell country hit, I was country when country wasn't cool. That's sort of how I feel about the way I grew up. At least 90% of what we ate every day came from the farm. But my education told me that, no, we weren't doing things right. Suddenly, all of the things that we didn't seem to need when I was growing up, like the antibiotics and, and a lot of the farm chemicals and, and the livestock pharmaceuticals and, and feed supplements, all of a sudden became very important. And I was convinced that if we were going to keep up with the times, we had to have that. And over the years, what I discovered was that we were having more and more problems not less, that in spite of all the research we were doing, in spite of all the new pharmaceuticals, all the new antibiotics, all the new supplements, all the new ag chemicals and fertilizers, things were not going well. Instead of solving the problem, what we were really doing was just constantly putting Band-Aids on what I now understand as a gushing wound. Farmers have the highest rate of suicide of any profession in the U.S. Their quality of life has diminished to the point that many of them hate what they have to do every day. I've never enjoyed mixing up a spray recipe of any kind. I've never enjoyed sitting in a sprayer. I've never enjoyed dealing with those chemicals with all the protective gear on. Farmers are finding that it's harder and harder for them to, to make a living, to maintain equity, and to have a viable business that they can pass down to their kids and their grandkids. And a huge part of that is the need for these annual operating loans that keep them heavily in debt. The current farm bill has got us to where we are right now. We have to financially produce the crops that we can ensure for the most profit. So that took a lot of the diversity out of our egg profile. The thing they're most afraid of is that they're gonna be the generation that failed and lost the farm. I knew that if we didn't do something, we were going to see a significant collapse in the existence of this family farm heritage and that multi-generational tradition. I was born and raised here. I'm the fourth generation on this farm, and I just had the fifth. Um, I've been here my entire life and had no ambition to go anywhere else. What we're doing here is setting our property up for my kids and my grandkids to farm it because the biggest thing that I've ever learned is we never own this land. We simply rent from the next generation. The beautiful thing about regenerative agriculture is that we can immediately begin implementing practices that are not going to cost the farmer, but are actually going to relieve financial burdens, particularly input burdens, and are going to increase their productivity in year one. It's very hard to hold a conversation with another farmer because we don't have that much in common anymore. And we know that we're talked about in the coffee shops and in the elevators and, and stuff like that and because we hear about it. 
and it doesn't bother us anymore. At first it was kind of lonely and it, it, it bothered us, but now it doesn't because the benefits of what we do here and what we're seeing and ultimately the bottom line far outweigh what people are saying about us. So it's, it's okay. And this is what we're doing is becoming slowly but surely a little bit more accepted. We went back to farming the way my dad's grandpa farmed, and to me, that's pretty cool. I've always felt like I was born into the wrong generation because I thought the way they were farming was pretty cool, and now we get to do it. Grant and Dawn Brightcruits are a wonderful story. One of the first things we did was we changed that monoculture cover crop into a highly complex, diverse cover crop and that immediately became a game changer for them. Overnight they went from having cover crop failures to having cover crop success. They have made an absolute complete turnaround in not only their production practices but more importantly their, their mindset. Hopefully it's not pink. Nope. That pink is our problem. What is that? Problem? That's the seed treatment. Ninety-nine point what eight percent of corn is treated with is that treated treatment. With treated seed. I'm pretty well convinced we don't need the treatment anymore. I mean, you look at what we got here. You know, with all these earthworms. I think we're done with that. Good. <laughs> that makes me happy. <laughs> the neat part is, is that 118-year-old seed company up the river here will provide us all the seed corn we need without that treatment. The consumer is driving the bus here. You know, they're, they're demanding more of this, and so it's becoming more popular, and they're looking for it more frequently, and people like us need to be able to meet that demand. My goal is within five years to have a storefront here on the farm. Um, I love having people out here to see what we're doing. I'm planning on going to a lot of farmers markets with the wagon and we're using social media to market beef. I'm hoping that that'll broaden our consumer base. their ability to be able to think about what they really need to be doing on their farm and how they need to be operating it. Uh, they have built significantly new soil, which conventional wisdom says no way you can build what they have built in the years that they have built it. And they have completely turned around their financial position, not just from a production standpoint, but also from a profitability standpoint. Not only is, is that food, you know, really, really good for you, but the pride in, in how, where that comes from is, is really awesome. In 2019 and 2020, 50 plus percent of all farmers in the U.S. are at significant risk for being able to get their annual operating loans renewed. And, and yet Grant and Dawn have provided a clear example of how to be able to feasibly step your way out of that situation and, and to be able to relieve both the financial pressure and the mental pressure. The first 12 rows of corn that we have in this section of corn here is the first corn that we've planted without any commercial fertilizer applied at all and so far we cannot see Anything on the plant health that shows that we're missing any nutrients on it at all. So far, time will tell, but yeah. we had to try it. Yield, the yield will be the yield will be the indicator. indicator, so. The average farmer farming conventionally is losing between three and four tons of topsoil per acre annually. Now, let's think about that. That's, that's untenable, and that's absolutely unsustainable. When you can get to 60 to 70 earthworms per square foot, you've kind of got 
your soil health fixed and, and we are we are very close if not over that amount. This was the 25 acres that we treated as just a corn soybean rotation with no cover crops. So last year we cover cropped it to fix it. We fixed it in one year. The model that we were using when we started wasn't fun. No. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. You know, we were only doing one thing. We were producing bushels. That's yeah. all it was, and it was a race to see who could produce the most bushels. And yet, you, when you had to go answer the bank or everybody else, it's not there financially. Mm -hmm. Now it's fun. Yeah. I mean, it's fun. What what could be yeah. better than going out at 5 o'clock in the morning riding through all this wildlife? And, yeah. 20 years ago, we couldn't have put together 10 people in a room. But yet, the number of people that are interested in regenerative practices and adaptive practices is growing very rapidly. When we met Dr. Zach Bush and started talking with him about what he had discovered and what he had uncovered, it really was a huge aha moment. Between 1996 and 2007, there was a complete reversal of our cancer map in the United States. To see an entire population respond in a single decade to a sudden explosion of cancer suggests that we did something similar to Chernobyl. We did some massive environmental injury that led to this explosive rise in cancer. And so we started you know, looking into this understanding of glyphosate as an antibiotic. Glyphosate became a commodity in farming in 1996. Before that, it was used as a weed killer by homeowners and farmers alike, and it had to be used sparingly because it kills everything it touches. That was the history of, of this glyphosate Roundup chemical until 1996, and suddenly it became a crop treatment that actually functions as an antibiotic, killing the, the bacteria and the fungi, the plants, killing all of that life, and it's incredibly a water-soluble toxin, which means it can be carried. And so we took the glyphosate spraying maps, but interestingly, they don't superimpose on our cancer death maps until you pull in the tributaries of the Mississippi River, and you suddenly realize that we're collecting some 80, 85 percent of all the glyphosate sprayed in the United States into a single water system. And if this is the most prevalent antibiotic in our environment that's decimating the microbiome in the soils, we had maybe a, a smoking gun. Maybe this is the event that, that really transformed public health. These degraded soils are not capable of producing highly nutrient-dense food. So the very foods that we're producing out of these soils now that are heavily degraded, they're deficient in the nutrients that we really need to properly feed our bodies and creating significant disease issues and neurological disorders and other illnesses that have degraded our health. Yeah. You think your great grandfather had seven chemicals sitting there killing everything in the soil? That's a, yeah. That's true. There's no way that was the case, yeah. else you would not have inherited a farm. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking at the end of this family farm tradition. And as they collapse, we open ourselves up to vulnerability because it's these multinational organizations that move in with money from China and South America, Russia, all over the world coming in to buy up massive swaths of the most fertile areas and they're owning our own land. No longer owned by Americans, let alone the farmers themselves. It makes absolutely no sense from any stance of homeland security or national safety, national independence. And if we look at this ever-expanding dependence and machine of mega farming scale, we become very prone to catastrophic failures of the delivery system. In the last month, we've had 18 million pounds of beef recalled through two different events because of E. coli and salmonella, these invasive bacteria that are a symptom of a collapse of the greater microbiome of those cows. 
It takes a mega industry to screw up that big, to make us that vulnerable. And so as the scale grows of the farm, we should not be deluded that that means safety. It means danger. It means an extreme dependence on an extremely tenuous situation. We have an opportunity, though, to overcome the fear. And I see that happening on these farms. Something like Grant and Don here reclaiming their right to grow, their right to transform, not just their crops and their soil, but themselves into independent, strong-minded, free people. There's a lot more people out there like us. And in our travels, we've gotten to meet a lot of them. And they're some of the most compassionate, giving, faithful, strong people I've ever met. <clears throat> we all have soft hearts, but it just, it just makes you keep going. Nobody knows better than a good farmer that we are simply the tip of the iceberg of biology when it comes to life on planet Earth. A farmer knows that their cattle, their livestock, their plants have an interdependence deep into the soil. It just seemed like we were fighting and fighting more and more often with Mother Nature. Mother Nature always wins. I don't care if it's in our livestock side of the operation or the grain side of it. And when we decided to finally start trying to work with Mother Nature is when things started working so much better out here. I cannot turn the tide in my clinics. I can't shift the momentum by working with one cancer patient at a time. It's far too slow, and it's not at the root of the cause. And so I look to these farmers to realize the salvation of human health. For Zach to reveal to us what he has seen and noticed in the medical profession, and for us to be able to reveal to Zach what we have seen on the actual food production side, and then when, you, when those two things meet in the middle, it begins to paint a picture that is pretty clear, but also very concerning. And it tells us that if we're going to turn around our own health and the health of our children and our grandchildren, We've got to start now. I hope you enjoy that. Uh, Farmers Footprint is a is just a fantastic organization that uh, is really doing some tremendous work, and we're just so happy to have uh, discovered them. The one thing they didn't get into in the film there was really what's happening down in the soil within the root systems. So I just want to take uh, a moment here to talk about the mycorrhizae, uh, which is really the the communication network. It's all the fungi that interact with the uh, the, the micronutrients in the soil. Uh, and transfer those into the plants, but they also are responsible for the communication that happens down within the ground between plants. And if you've, uh, if this is new to you, this has been a science now that they've been studying for a number of years, and it's only now just really getting to be understood. So we know that plants communicate both above the ground, but also below the ground. And so that's why we want to start to minimize the disturbance, and that's why we can get so much more out of plant growth when we, uh, when we learn how to work with the soil instead of uh, chewing it up. So some of the obvious differences to show you here in a few, just a short series of slides is a chicken CAFO, so it's a commercial animal feeding operation if you hear CAFO. So those are cage-free uh, chickens, uh, what it looks like, but they're inside an enclosure. 
Uh, certainly an unnatural social structure for them. Uh, it's forced growth, typically corn versus grass fed, uh, high pathogen concentration just because you have so many uh, packed in that, that that small space. There'd be literally thousands of, uh, of chickens in there. And as a result of having that high concentration, they also have some contaminated waste uh, issues that are generated, uh, filled with antibiotics. And so, so that's not uh, waste that they can use anywhere else. Alternatively, when you look at regenerative agriculture, it's in an outdoor environment. Uh, they, they're relying on natural growth or allowing natural growth with the chickens. Uh, it's a rolling system. It's hard to make out there, perhaps, but you can see a bit of a, that's actually a sled. So if it's a good sized one here. The farmer would come along every day or you know, every couple of days, depending on how long uh, or how, how big it is and, uh, and how many chickens he's got in there latches his tractor on and he pulls it the length of that uh, enclosure. So if that enclosure is, say, 50 feet long, he just advances at 50 feet, and then they get a, a fresh supply of grass and in the process of eating the grass, and then uh, they're depositing their waste right back into the grass. So that's how they're, they're getting the fertilizer back into the soil quite naturally. So animals serve an important role in regenerative agriculture in that regard as well. And so the CAFOs exist obviously in the cattle world as well. That's uh, pr perhaps uh, equally well known. Again, issues with the social structure that they're in, uh, typically going to be in that environment. It's common to give them a lot of growth hormones. Again, corn versus grass fed, high pathogen concentration again. Again, issues with contaminated waste. Uh, you can't put that out on the farm like you, we might think that uh, farmers do. Versus regenerative agriculture again. So the cattle are certainly free range. Uh, they have lots of room to grow. Now, th they'll have rolling pens that they'll move around. So they'll move the fences around every few days. Um, so the idea is they're managing the, uh, uh, the grass feed that the cattle are allowed to consume. And they just keep moving that through. And so the same system you saw with the chickens is uh, the cow waste actually goes back. And so it's transferring the, the, um, the, the grass or whatever they're eating is transferred immediately back into fertilizer, back into the soil, and that gets the microbes all excited and the ecology just thrives in that environment. So monocrop versus polyculture, to give you an idea what that looks like. If you've been in uh, any of the states that have big farm operations, they look like the ones on the left, whatever type of crop it might be. Again, that's nothing we would ever see in nature. It tends to create uh, weak crops over time as very high dependency on inputs. When we say inputs, we're talking about chemicals, fertilizers, and such. Uh, they're typically going to be all GMO seeds, and they're going to have a shorter growing season because they're generally only growing one crop. Uh, and so that results in some yield limitations uh, for a number of reasons. If we compare that to the polyculture uh, system we see on the right there, you see an abundance of crops being grown all neighboring each other. And that's part of the, the magic or the science of putting this together is understanding which crops grow really well together. And so we can, we can use certain crops that'll attract, for example, certain birds that'll eat certain insects that may infest some other plants. Uh, there may be uh, things that attract bees or some other insects that we want to help with pollination. So it's really starting to marry now is how does ecology manage this naturally? So how do we mimic what ecology does naturally? And to the best of our ability, that's what we're really trying to do while at the same time getting uh, yields out. In the course of operating this way, they end up uh, typically having higher yields than they would with a monocrop. So this is really now how farmers are starting to realize how they can make more money uh, rather than uh, give it all away to the chemical company. And to give you an idea for what that means to a farmer, typically about 30% of what their cost is are what they call inputs. So that's going to be uh, GMO seeds typically and all the chemicals uh, that they have to put on those uh, plants as they're growing. So if you can cut that 30% out or certainly a big portion of that out, your farm operation now is, is going to be in a much better position financially to make money. And with a polyculture, it also allows you to get multiple uh, crops in a season. So, so they typically see higher yield per acre than you would off of a monocrop. And that's really one of the biggest changes from organic is they figured out now how to get more product off per acre for less effort. 
So here's a, uh, a vineyard operation again, give you an idea of what a conventional uh, vineyard would look like. And certainly we know that in California, the, uh, the winemakers have really taken a hit in recent years because of uh, the use of Roundup or glyphosate in their crops. Uh, so they're now trying to figure out how to get off of that and convert into what would be more traditional uh, uh, grape growing. And so on the right, you see what a, a regenerative agriculture vineyard would look like. So it's typically biodynamic. So again, that's more the uh, driving off of the, the balanced ecology. It's not new. It's been around for a long time. We just understand the science of it better now. So we've got, again, cover crops in place there. You can see the... Uh, the livestock is allowed to roam free and they've got some jobs to keep those uh, grasses managed to, to length. And of course, they're putting the fertilizer right back in the soil like we've seen uh, elsewhere too. So you saw particularly in the Kiss the Ground video, uh, some of the issues with not having a cover crop. So on the left, uh, this may be a familiar sight to you when you think about uh, late summer when uh, when whatever the crop has been harvested and the farmer just strips it off and it sits barren uh, for typically several months until a, uh, till next year's crop comes along versus cover crops serve a, a, an important purpose in terms of re-energizing the soil, bringing nutrients back into the soil. And depending on the, what the soil needs are, you would match that up with a cover crop that would inject a, a lot of the nutrients uh, back into the soil. And there's many to choose from. Again, that's the that's understanding the uh, the, the science behind it uh, rather than trial and error. And that's what uh, a great example of where farmers are looking for help and uh, what Farmers Footprint is able to do for them. So I mentioned earlier that's the same shot on the left you see around uh, around breaking up the soil or mechanical weeding. So in a regenerative agriculture situation, another orchard on the right. You see the differences. It's got a you know a, a a very modest cover crop in the middle. They've got a bit of a trench to help to make sure that the water all tends to uh, ten, tends to drain towards the, the trees. But as you compare those two operations, just side by side, uh, regenerative agriculture takes less work, uh, less equipment, less chemical input, less soil erosion as a result, uh, less cost because you can take all those uh, labor and input costs out has higher water retention now because the plant is going to absorb more of the, uh, the cover crop is going to absorb that water. It also means that in the summer that soil is going to be much cooler, so it's going to have much lower evaporation rates than when the sun gets on a bare soil. It would be probably perhaps 20, 30, or even more uh, degrees hotter than the, uh, the soil on the right with the cover crop on it. And so we're going to get a lot more diversity or biodiversity in that soil. And result, of course, is a more resilient uh, plant and a resilient product, whatever the fruit is coming off that plant. So what's going on under the ground? Well, you can see on the left there, the that bacteria cloud. So these are the things now as we start to understand what's going on in terms of the, again, the communication and how the nutrient uptake happens within the soil environment. So the bacteria is, is really active down in the soil and around the roots with that cloud that gets generated number of different bacteria at play there and they're all working together to feed the plant naturally. So you can look on the right even the things like the root balls you'd compare this was a uh, a field study looking at conventional versus regenerative agriculture and you can see the different sizes in the root balls it creates and I think everyone would understand a root ball that's twice as big is going to generate uh, a larger plant on top that has uh, more output for you. So as we think about regenerative agriculture, it's really a biodiversity that enriches soils, improves watersheds, and enhances ecosystem services. It's about captured carbon in the soil and in the above ground biomass. It uh, generally has increased yields, resilience to climate instability, and higher health and vitality for farming and ranching communities when they don't have to handle all those chemicals. Uh, it's about applied science by global communities. This is going on around the world now. Uh, with organic farmers, the agroecology, holistic management, and agroforestry. Got a lower environmental footprint than any farming operation that has ever been developed, uh, and it's now into a more viable, sustainable business for farmers. And it's, as I said earlier, it's really the next generation in organic farming. And this will, this will be a big game changer coming forward as if organic wasn't already having enough impact. So what can I do? 
Well, I know I can reduce my toxic load to reduce oxidative and immune stress, and with that come a reduction in the odds of chronic disease and cancer. Good things. So how do I do that? Well, I buy local organic whenever possible. And if you're not sure which ones are the ones that are best bang for your buck, refer to the uh, Dirty Dozen or Clean 15. If you Google, if you Google that, you'll certainly find it easily. Uh, I can s- start a victory garden in my backyard, and that's something we do as well. And just just to get some plants growing is a great experience. It gets everybody reconnected back with uh, our food quite easily. Generally, raised beds work really well, but you can do it in pots. You can do it in the ground. Keep an eye open for the regenerative agriculture label. Uh, there's a couple in play right now. I'm not sure what that's going to look like, but it will replace what you would be familiar with seeing perhaps as uh, the organic label. I'd, I always encourage everybody to visit a farm, join a, a CSA, which are community-supported agriculture programs. You can sign up to get your vegetables uh, for the year there at a fraction of what you'd probably pay at the market. Um, many of those... Uh, CSA farmers are already practicing regenerative agriculture. If you eat meat and poultry, you always want to be looking for free range, uh, no antibiotics in them, and no hormones. Uh, and I'd encourage you, you know, if you if you do eat meat and poultry, one of the best things you can do as well is, is try to get your consumption down a couple of times a week. is a much healthier balance for, uh, for meat intake, and many would suggest... Uh, You want to get that down even less than that. How can I get involved? Well, Support Farmers Footprint, I think, would be a great place. Great nonprofit. They're there there to help educate uh, farmers, get off their chemical dependency. Um, You can look at local investment opportunities, uh, whether you might have land or are interested in uh, purchasing land. And there's certainly young farmers that have a hard time getting going with the upfront capital costs. There's some partnerships there that often work well in small communities. Sounds like there'll be an investment fund opportunity coming in 21, organized by Farmers Footprint, and that's going to be a tremendous alternative or a really exciting alternative, I think, to what the government insurance program is and all the risks and downsides that uh, farmers have if they sign up for that. Uh, And then the fourth one there is the Kiss the Ground, the other nonprofit. Again, they're focused more on public education, and the better we get the public educated, who is the consumer, the biggest impact that we're going to have. I hope you found that interesting and educational. I'll post some links on some other uh, Regenerative Ag videos that are out there that I think are some great stories that people have told. And uh, really anything you can do to support that community, I think, would be... Th- would be just tremendous. There's never been a time when farmers needed uh, needed more help than they do right now. And also, there's never been a time they've had as much opportunity as they do right now. So to be able to play a hand in that, I think, uh, and, and be the benefactor in the food that you get access to, it's just, uh, it's a great opportunity. So I so hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for hanging in there till the end, and we'll see you next time. And until then, be well. <laughs>